joining us in worship this morning. He's so holy. He's so worthy. Let's give him the praise. Yeah. Hallelujah. Uh, thank you guys for joining us. You, <laughs> you can turn to somebody next to you and just say good morning and thank you for being here. Good morning, Radiant Church. Good morning. Hey, can we give a warm welcome to Richie and Vanessa and family this morning? Uh, today is one of our favorite days. And I say that, I feel like every Sunday, but this is a super special day. Richie and Vanessa have dedicated their lives to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All the ways of the Lord. I was just reading the Great Commission the other day, and in the very one of those lines that you know you read so many times, and you've heard the Great Commission of you know, go and teach all the things that I have um, that I have commanded you, and it's such a strong word. We've heard it so many times, but he, he literally Jesus said, "Go teach all the things in all the world of all the things that I have commanded you," and that's what they're saying today that they're going to do with their own in their own home, and they're with their children. So like the days of old, when Samuel was brought to the church to be dedicated to the Lord, we're going to dedicate sweet Remy to the Lord, or they're going to dedicate sweet Remy to the Lord, but then we're going to give her back for you to raise her in the ways of the Lord. Will you join me as we pray today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this precious gift from God. We thank you, God, for her sweet health and her beautiful face, Lord Jesus. We thank you for, God, giving your life for her. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus that early in her childhood, early in her life, she will know the love of her parents and know the love of her Savior, Jesus Christ. God, may she see it in her family and her siblings. May she see it in her parents and may she see it in her church in the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus. We ask you, Lord, to protect her feet, to guide her in every step that she takes. May they be ordered by the Lord in Jesus' money name. I pray that you give her wisdom that is straight from your heart for her, her life. God, may she lean on you and not her on her own understanding in the mighty name of Jesus. God, we pray the name of Jesus over sweet Remy, the name of Jesus over her life. God, we proclaim favor in everywhere and every place and every part of her life in Jesus' life-changing name. God, we pray that you go before her in the mighty name of Jesus that battles are already won before she even gets to the battleground in Jesus name and now let's pray for their sweet parents Heavenly Father, we thank you for mom and dad and family, God. We thank you for this act of faith, God, and this act of this amazing statement saying that our, their kids are yours. God, I pray that you give them protection and wisdom, God. I pray that you give them wisdom like King Solomon, wisdom straight from your heart, God, to theirs. God, the big decisions and the small decisions, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you're in the middle of it all. Heavenly Father, I pray, God, that you're in the middle of their marriage. May it be an example of to others what love looks like, what faithfulness looks like, what parenting looks like in the mighty name of Jesus. Bind them together with cords that cannot be broken with you being in the middle of that those cords in Jesus' name, in the middle of their life, in the middle of their parenting. And when they're tired and when they're weary, God, may they keep their eyes on you. And may they be faithful to you as you are faithful to them in every step and every way of their life, in every circumstance they find themselves in, in the hard times and the good times, God. Give them favor and show up and show off. God, in the mighty name of Jesus, may they live lives that shine bright for you, that mirror you for their kids to watch, for their kids to mimic as they chase after you. In Jesus, precious, amazing, forgiving, life-giving name. We all said amen and amen. Will you give a warm welcome to them one more time? You may exit.
Wow, isn't that amazing? So awesome. Oh, what an honor, what an honor. And then there's our part. The second part of that is you're not alone. Richie, you're not alone. Look at your family. We're not, we're not gonna let them go through life by themselves and we're not gonna let each other go through life by ourselves because we don't have to. As iron sharpens iron, we sharpen each other and we lean on each other as we chase after Jesus. With that in mind, let's give it up for all of our first time guests this morning. Come on, give it up. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. When you find Radiant Church, you find an amazing place. And it's because of the love of Jesus Christ. That can, it's like no other. There's not even a comparison. And it's because of everyone else around you. That's the reason Radiant is amazing. And it's also because we have amazing lead pastors, pastors Todd and Kelly. So welcome to Radiant Church. Now, if it's your first time, your second time, or even your third time, I wanna invite you to fill out a connection card just like this you'll find in the chair in front of you. There's also a QR code that you can scan. Either way is absolutely awesome. It's just a quick way to get to know each other. Maybe you have some questions that we can answer, or you'd like to be signed up for the e-news. You can hear all about Radiant Church, everything that's going on by just checking that little square for the e-news. Or maybe you'd like to become a member. That's a great first step to check that, or if you even have prayer. Now you can drop these connection cards off in the buckets as they go by in just a few moments, or you can take it to the Welcome Center. But best yet, you can take it to the Meet the Pastors table where Pastor Kelly will be after service and she'd love to meet you. Welcome to Radiant Church. We're so happy you're here. Uh, again, man, when you're here, it's, it's the greatest thing. It's like, it's so much better than Olive Garden when you're here, you're family. Yeah, when you're not here, you're still family. Welcome to Radiant Church. Now I also, <laughs> I also, maybe I'm just hungry. Um, may, I also want to invite everyone to be a part of our Ascent classes. Our Ascent classes are where you will learn and hear all about Radiant Church. It's even a discipleship class. And it's a discipleship class for those that maybe you just gave your life to Christ last week, or maybe this morning you knew like, oh my goodness, this Jesus is the real King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's a discipleship class for those that have just come to Christ, but it's also amazing for those that maybe you've served Christ for a hundred years and everyone in between. It's also where you hear all about Radiant Church. It's where you become a member and you don't don't want to miss it. So if you'd like more information about the Ascent classes, just email us at connect at radiantchurch.org, connect at radiantchurch.org, and our very own Miss Jenny Dunn will email you and send you all the classes and connect with you so you won't miss anything. She's absolutely amazing. Again, that's connect at radiantchurch.org. And you can also stop by the Welcome Center for more information. Well, we saw some new t-shirts on stage today. Did you see those? Pastor Andres was rocking that. I kind of got it on right here. It's, they're absolutely super cool shirts. They're on sale, for sale, at the cafe today for $15. You don't want to miss it. Make sure you grab one today so it makes everyone have to order more. And that would be super cool if we have to get more. So again, the sh shirts are on sale in the cafe for $15. This coming Friday night. Does anyone love our worship time here? Does anyone love that? Come on. Radiant Church, are you alive and active? It's got alive in your heart. Yes, he is. We're going to have a night of worship and prayer this coming Friday night from 7 p.m. I say a night. It's a night in the morning. From 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. this Friday night at North Campus. You won't want to miss it. It's going to be absolutely awesome. Jump in. Make sure you cut some time out and get there. It's going to be an amazing night when uncommon people pray to an, an uncommon God and we are faithful to him. He is absolutely always faithful to hear his people. So we're going to get together we're going to chase after him this Friday night. Don't miss it. And one last one, because, well, because it's my heart and it's winter retreat. Winter retreat is around the corner. Yeah, that's the right answer. Good job. Winter retreat is around the corner. It's February 16th through the 20th. It's a $275. Inflation hit it hard. But with that, with saying that, the camps have been hidden by it with inflation too. Money will never be the reason your high schooler doesn't go to camp. Never. Because God moves when we, when we just cut away stuff. Pastor Kelly preaches it. I've heard her say it. I've lived it out. The number, there's two reasons that we send our kids to camp or why we go to retreat or why we send them to youth, why we, why we, why we live lives of uncommon parenting. The number one reason is for the encounter of the King of Kings. That is the reason we go to winter retreat. For our kids to encounter Jesus, there's something special. Everything changes. I love apologetics, but there's nothing like it when our kids or when you and I encounter the King of Kings. And God's people say, amen. 
Amen. The second reason is friends. It's just that simple. We need each other to lean on. And maybe your kid or your high schooler doesn't have a friend. Send them to camp. Two amazing reasons. And again, money will never be the reason. You just, you know, God's will, God's bill. And the church said, amen. Amen and amen. And now, as our ushers come forward to receive today's tithes and offering, there are a few different ways you can give here at Radiant Church. You can give in the offering buckets as they go by, or you can give online at radiantchurch.org, or you can even text any amount to the number 84321. You can actually use the app too, the Radiant Church app. You can give in any of those, any of those ways. But before we pray, Today is the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, which means we're going to pray um, for unity in our government to have their hearts set right for the protection of life. Good things have happened in many states. The number is like 89,000 lives have been saved. 89,000 unborn, right? That's worth, that's worth cheering for, amen. But what's super cool about that is those 89,000 are little kids now. Is that not amazing? They're growing up. It's, it's the, it's that we need to take it past the, the, the unborn. Like we, I know we know it, but it's nice to say it. Like these are little children that are running around in these beautiful states that, that change the law. Well, there's also hundreds of thousands of lives that have been murdered. And we're going to pray today as we pray over the tithes and the offering. And as we pray over pastors, Todd and Kelly, will you join me? Heavenly Father, you are faithful. You are amazing. And we give you all praise and glory, God. We cannot thank you enough for the lives that have been saved. God, we ask you, Lord Jesus, to do it again and again and again. What seemed impossible for years, you flipped it, and you are the God of the impossible, making it possible. And we proclaim the name of Jesus over our states in the United States that have have horrible laws where murder is happening. And God, we ask you to grip the heart of men and women that are making decisions to kill our children of the states. And God, may it spread. May this may this spread from one state to the next and all across the world. May abortion be absolute, absolutely taken out of, our, out of our world, out of our system, out of our states, out of our laws in the mighty name of Jesus. And may you get all the praise and all the glory. We give it all to you. It's all yours. It was always yours and it will always be yours. You are amazing, God. We say, do it again. Do it again. 89,000, God, is a good start. Go again and again in Jesus' mighty name. Heavenly Father, we proclaim your name over, over Pastors Todd and Kelly this morning. May their words be from your heart, God anoint them in mighty, the mighty name of Jesus. May our hearts be ready to receive what you have. You are the God of the individual. No matter who came in here, no matter what they are carrying, God, you love them, God, and I pray that you draw them close to you. And God, may our hearts be ready to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' life-changing name, the church said amen. Amen. And we believe God is about to pour his spirit out in another mighty wave of revival, awakening, and reformation. We are praying and believing America can be saved and America will be saved if there is a remnant in this hour who will step into that place of uncommon prayer with our Lord. Well, good morning. Good morning, Woodland Park campus, uh, Central Campus. Why don't you help me in welcoming everyone who's with us online this morning and everyone who's with us at our Woodland Park campus with Pastor Dustin. We are in a year of uncommon prayer. Leading up to this year, the months leading up to this year, the Lord continually spoke to Pastor Todd and myself, and not only to us, but to pastors and leaders around the nation, that 2024 was to be set apart as a year of uncommon prayer, which is why our son Luke designed these t-shirts as a holy reminder to what God has called us to in this hour. We have the depiction of Jesus, and, and I want to encourage you throughout this year to be reminded of and to reflect on Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed and he interceded in prevailing 
and travailing prayer that was so intense that the scripture says that he sweat great drops of blood. But the important thing for us today is to remember that Jesus cried out to his disciples. Three times it's recorded in the scripture. He repeatedly asked them to enter into that place of uncommon prayer with him in the garden, yet they would not. Three times he went back to them, to Peter, James, and John. Three times he found them sleeping. And the Lord is calling his church, his bride, in this hour once again to enter into a place of uncommon prayer together with Jesus, our high priest, who forever lives to make intercession on our behalf. Let's give him praise for, for who he is, for all that he's done, and for all that he continues to do. And the fact that he calls us to partner with him is absolutely humbling, is it not? So, today we are looking at prayer arsenal. If you missed last week, please go back and, and watch that message online because that was part one in this series, Uncommon Prayer and Prevailing Prayer. But today we're going to look at prayer arsenal and some of the ways that God has called us to enter into prayer as a means of spiritual warfare that enables us to prevail over the kingdom of Satan and over the powers of darkness. Now, before we get into all of that, I have to say once again, we are living in a very uncommon time. Amen? Oh boy, that may be the understatement of the year so far. This past week, the World Economic Forum met in Davos, Switzerland. Now, did anyone else see any of the clips or segments from that meeting? Go ahead, hold up your hands. Just a few of you. Well, if you saw them, you will never forget them, right? It was like watching something out of a science fiction horror film. It was unbelievable. These are considered the world elites who come together to devise and strategize the plans for the world so that they can dominate the people. I mean, that's literally what they do, folks. And Todd and I were aghast when we watched a shaman, a witch, they had a witch come to this meeting where they are determining the, the world and how they will govern and, it, and dictate what happens in our world today. They're the ones who gave us the great reset. So they had a witch with demo, a demonically painted face and her witch's garments, cloaks, and she went through and casted spells over each of the members of the panel that was on the platform, and then went to each of them and poof, breathed on them demonic spirits, invoking the pagan gods. Uh, unbelievable. These are the people that are leading our world, so to speak. Friends, we're living in un common times. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, and we must occupy until he comes. And this is why the Lord has called his church to awaken. Don't sleep through this time of uncommon evil, church. Don't, don't get sucked into your screens to where you forget or neglect or ignore or deny the calling of God upon the body of Christ in this hour. He needs you. He needs me. He needs Radiant Church. He needs the, he's chosen to need. He doesn't need us because he's needy. He's chosen to need us, to partner with him in order to bring his kingdom, to invoke the kingdom principles and purposes of God that were achieved by Jesus Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection. We are his ambassadors on the earth, and we are called to be part of the holy remnant in this hour that enters into uncommon prayer like never before, to see another great move of God, to see another great awakening, awakening because that is exactly what it will take in the world, in our nation, in our families, in this hour. Give him praise because he's still doing it. So I don't know if you should go look up that meeting. 
of the World Economic Forum or not, because it's not a pretty picture. It was something that as we were watching it, and we were listening, listening to this witch cast her demonic spells and incantations. I just started praying in the spirit and decreeing the power of the blood of Jesus as it was coming through the computer screen. It was horrific, folks. But you know what? We have a God who is greater, who is mightier. He is the only God. He is the sovereign God. He is Adonai, El, Sh El, El Shaddai, El Elyon. No one compares to him. So we praise him throughout these uncommon days. But friends, we are called by God to rebel against hell's agenda. That's why God has called us to be holy rebels, that we're to partner with heaven in a holy rebellion against demonic entities, plans, strategies, and agendas of hell. And this is something God calls every one of us to. None of us are exempt. If you're in the body of Christ, you are called to rebel against hell and demon strategies. And our first and primary weapon as followers of Christ is uncommon prayer. Say it with me. Uncommon prayer. So we see the dark spiritual forces at work in our world more clearly and more openly now than ever before in my lifetime and in your lifetime. They are blatantly in our faces. It's no longer underlying in the shadows, out of sight. Now it's blatant and in our faces, it's undeniable. And while they may seem ominous and overpowering, God has given us spiritual weapons to engage successfully and effectively in warfare against these dark principalities and even the witches and the shamans that the World Economic Forum elicits to come in to cast spells and incantations over the world. They are no match for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Praise his name forever. In Ephesians 6, Paul tells us that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not wrestling against human beings, but against the spirits of darkness, the principalities and the powers of darkness that are behind those personalities and those persons, those human beings. And in these uncommon days of evil, we must put on the full armor of God every day. It used to be that we'd learn about it in Sunday school and once in a while in prayer, we'd remember and go, oh yeah, I need to put on the full armor of God. Friends, we are in an uncommon time where you better not get out of bed until you put on the full armor of God. In Ephesians 6, Paul says, you're not wrestling against human beings. You're wrestling against dark powers, against principalities and powers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realm, in the heavenly places. He said, so you better put on the full armor of God. You better put on the helmet of salvation every day and you better guard and protect what goes into your head and what thoughts you allow to take root in your mind. Friends, the mind, an idle mind, it's been said, an idle mind is the devil's playground. And that is so true. That's where the main battlefield is first fought and won. That's why we're instructed to take every thought captive and you make it obey Christ. You don't just let any thought come in willy-nilly and take over and take you wherever it wants to take you because Satan will take you right into hellish paths of darkness. Put the helmet of salvation on for the glory of God. And then every day you put on the breastplate of righteousness to above all else guard your heart. Our daughter Faith who led worship this morning, she said, mom, I believe what God's telling me in this time is that she said the two words God's giving me for this year are humility and holiness. He's calling the church to humility and holiness. Friends, that's our breastplate. You don't let anything into your heart that corrupts humility and, and holiness. That's how we guard our hearts because out of your heart come all the other issues of life. So you guard your heart with all diligence. Don't you let impurity and corruption and perversion and wickedness come into your heart. The belt of truth, that's everyone in the word every day. Every day we've got to put everything, pull everything together in our lives, in our hearts, in our homes with the word of truth. 
the shoes of peace, choosing daily to let the peace of God dwell in us richly by Christ Jesus. Because every day we choose multiple times a day. We either put on peace, we put on shoes of peace, and we walk in peace and let peace dwell in us richly, or we neglect to do that. And instead, we let chaos, bitterness, unforgiveness, doubt, fear, anxiety, depression, unbelief, we let that dwell in us richly. And God's saying, oh, no, 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 don't, don't you dare go that route. You put on the belt of truth and you put on the shoes of peace and then you take up the shield of faith. And when the fiery darts of the enemy come at you, because they come every day, don't they? Is there anybody here who says, oh no, I have days where the enemy doesn't come at me at all. (laughs) I don't know what planet you're living on, (laughs) but you take up your shield of faith. And when the enemy tries to attack you, and if you missed last week's message, go back and listen, because Satan has come to sift all of us like wheat, to beat us over the head with those lies, with those condemnations, those accusations, torment, depression, discouragement, darkness, bitterness, fear, anxiety. He comes at every one of us every day in some way. You take that shield of faith to extinguish every fiery dart of the enemy. And then you take up the sword of the spirit, the word of God. And every lie that the enemy brings against you, you demolish it and destroy it with the word of God, just like Jesus did in the wilderness. You cannot neglect putting on the full armor of God. And in Matthew 24, I'm stuck on this. I've been meditating on this for the youth group tonight because I get to speak to the youth. And we're going to look at the 10 virgins, the five wise virgins, the five foolish virgins. The five wise knew how important it was to set everything else aside and buy oil. And that's the hour we're living in, friends. But the, the, in, the, in Matthew 24, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, Lord, explain to us the end, end times, the signs of the last days. And the very first thing Jesus says is this. He said, in the last days, there's going to be a great, de- great deception. Listen, when you have the World Economic Forum doing what they did, and you see the world around us flying pride flags, when God says very clearly that it is an abomination, he hates pride, he opposes the proud, and yet we pride, with pride, we wave it in his face. And, and, and there is a great deception, friends. We are living in a time of uncommon deception. Can you feel it? Can you hear it? Can you see it? Those little devices that are glued to our hands and our faces are glued to the screens. They are deception devices. If you don't learn to guard your heart and shut out the lies of the enemy, you will be led astray. You will be deceived. And so Jesus said to the disciples, the very first thing, take heed that you aren't deceived in those last days. I am astounded at the number of Christians I see on a, on a regular basis, not just personally, but, but hearing about it around the, the world, around the nation that are deconstructing their faith, that are falling away from the faith because we're living in the last days. We're living in a time of great deception and they didn't pay attention to what Jesus said when he said, take heed that you're not deceived. This is so important in this hour. So all of these weapons are given to us for the purpose of prevailing against the darkness. And I'm saying prevailing. That means we win. We overcome. That's the plan of God. The plan of God isn't, well, you just give it your best shot and hope for the best and maybe you'll get there. Oh, no. Oh, no. We are partnering with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's already won. It is finished. Now we partner with heaven to enforce the finished work of Jesus and the power of the cross and his resurrection in the day, in the hour in which we live. Are you with me? I'm telling you, church, I come up here and I never plan on getting this riled up, but it's like I step behind the pulpit and the fire of God falls every time. (sighs) Ephesians 6, 18, he goes through the armor 
And then he says, after you put on the armor, he said, pray, you pray always. You're to stand firm, praying always. Say it with me. Praying always with all prayer. Say all prayer and, su- and supplication in the spirit. So first I'm gonna talk about praying always. Friends, this is uncommon because we, again, have lived in a nation where we've had it good. We've been a nation that has been in peace. But we are no longer a nation at peace. We're a nation that is in a very serious war. A war that begins in the heavenlies against principalities and powers of darkness that want to completely destroy our nation. Satan comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. And we are in a time, we have been in a time of peace where, where people have just kind of flippantly gone through the day and, you know, maybe we'll do a little five or 10 minute Devo and then we just charge into our day and, and do all of our activities and, and all of the things that are on our calendar and on our agenda and, and, and we'll pray over meals and, and, uh, you know, maybe say a little prayer before we go night, night. We're not living in that time anymore. We're in an uncommon time. If you're just throwing God five or 10 minutes a day, uh, friend, I have to warn you, you, you are on dangerous territory. This isn't a time for a five or 10 minute Devo. This is a time for uncommon prayer. This is a time to go to the Holy Spirit, whom the Bible says will be your teacher and your counselor. And you say, Holy Spirit, teach me how to pray always. If the Bible says pray always, you teach me how to pray always. And that means, I'm going to tell you this, I'm going to fast forward. We're going to talk about this in a few minutes. But one of the easiest ways to do this is you must be baptized in the Holy Spirit because you can pray in tongues as you're driving in the car. You can pray in tongues quietly and under your breath as you're shopping in the grocery store. I'm going to, again, I'm going to jump ahead because I'm just letting the Holy Spirit lead this morning. Back in November, we had a roar service. And in that roar service, the Lord spoke to me. I was supposed to lead in prayer for evangelism and souls. And the Holy Spirit arrested me and said, told me, you, you cannot pray for that until you do this. He said, you've got to pray in the Spirit more. In these times, you have to pray in the spirit more and you have to tell the church in this time of increased warfare in the spirit realm, you must pray in the spirit more. And then he took me to 1 Corinthians 14, 15, where Paul says, I will pray in the spirit and I will pray in the understanding. I will sing in the spirit and I will sing in the understanding. And the Holy Spirit showed me something I'd never noticed before, that we reverse it. We pray in the understanding, and then sometimes we pray in the Spirit. We sing in the understanding, and then sometimes we sing in the Spirit. But God is saying, in this time, right now, this is very strategic. You have to pray in the Spirit more. Why? Because most of us can't see into the Spirit realm. And we cannot see the war strategy and the spiritual battle that is taking place. But Almighty God sees it. And the Spirit of God intercedes through us in other tongues. Friends, if this makes you uncomfortable, I pray for the peace of God that passes human understanding and that you would know this is the word of the Lord. And anyone who says it isn't, they have taken away from the word of God and they have eliminated truth in an unholy partnership with hell because hell does not want you to pray in the Spirit. Because the powers of hell are terrified of Because the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, when you pray in an unknown tongue, you don't know what you're praying, but the Spirit of God is praying through you mysteries, divine mysteries that hit the mark, that hit the bullseye every time. They don't miss because we are getting in the way. I don't know exactly what to pray, but I know in this hour, I have to pray always. And I have to pray with all kinds of prayer. That's just one kind of prayer. 
But if you say, well, I don't pray in tongues. I want you to be open to the promise of the Father because that's what Jesus called it. He said, the promise of the Father is coming. He said, when I go, I'm going to send the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. He said, and you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and fire. But you have to wait for it. You have to tarry for it. You have to want it. And, and, and listen, this is one of those things that you cannot receive with your natural carnal mind. It's, the, the Bible tells us that the natural mind, the carnal mind is death. But the spiritual mind that is set on Christ Jesus is life. And you've got to be open. We've got to be open to say, Abba, Father, I may not understand it all, but I want everything you have for me. I don't want to be handicapped in any way in this hour. And so at the end of this service, there will be prayer team members down here, and they will pray for you and pray with you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. All you have to do is be saved and say, okay, Lord, I'm ready for the promise of the Father now. Baptize me with the Holy Spirit and fire. And listen, and I know this may make some people uncomfortable, but friends, when you're in war, you got to get over being uncomfortable. You got to get over yourself. You got to get over your pride that says, well, I just don't know about that. That makes me uncomfortable. Well, in a time of war, we need to take every weapon that God has give us, given us in order to prevail. Amen. It's a time for uncommon prayer. I don't even know what I'm going to do now because I got way ahead of myself. Woo! Oh, so he says, pray always. This is uncommon. Now, there are different kinds of prayers. There are prayers invoking God's name and his presence into a situation. There are many times when I have infirmity in my body and I will just start praising the Lord Jehovah Rapha, that he is the Lord, my healer, and he's healing me now. Or there are times when the enemy's trying to bring fear and anxiety and I invoke God's presence by, by just praising him and thanking him. He's Jehovah Shalom. He is the Lord, my peace, and I let the peace of God dwell in me richly by Christ Jesus. So there's invoking God's name into a situation, into a church, into a family, into a nation. And then there are prayers of communion, my favorite, where you shut yourself up alone with him and, and you just talk to him. You pour your heart out to him and, and you stop and you listen and you let him to minister to your spirit. And then there are prayers of petition where we plead a righteous case with the God of the universe. And then there are prayers of agreement when we come together with other believers in one accord and there is a supernatural acceleration of power when we come together in agreement. There are prayers of deep, fervent, prevailing intercession and praying in the spirit, as I just said, or to pray in the spirit and pray in the understanding. But I think there's a divine order there. He said, pray in the spirit. That came first. And then the understanding and sing in the spirit and then sing in the understanding. So ponder that, take that before the Lord. Friends, prayer isn't just communication with God and it certainly isn't just a sweet, calming little devotional exercise that I do each day to reach a state of peace. No, prayer is our primary weapon of war against the powers of darkness. And God's calling us to a year of uncommon prayer. C.S. Lewis said, prayer is fundamentally a warfare activity. John Piper said, you cannot know what prayer is for until you realize that this life is war. Isn't that good? We are warring against demonic powers to enforce the finished work of the cross and the resurrection. And it's a battle. It's a battle. Unfortunately, I know some of you have heard us talking about this a lot for a while, but unfortunately, the majority of people in the body of Christ in America still have their fingers in their ears singing, da 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 da, I don't want to hear. They just want to keep sleeping like lazy dogs sleeping by the fire because it's not comfortable to realize where we are and what we're called to. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4 says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We don't lean on our own human understanding. We don't war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not, not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. 
Here's another thing that John Piper said. He said, the number one reason prayer doesn't work for many saints is because they've taken a wartime walkie-talkie and turned it into a domestic intercom. Come on, friends. It's a time for uncommon prayer. It's an essential weapon in the spiritual battle that we're engaged in. And that's why the apostle Paul calls it the good fight of faith. It's a fight, but it's a good fight because we are partnering with good to war against evil and to enforce the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. It's a fight for our families. Nehemiah, he called the people of God to, and he said, you must fight for your children, fight for your wives, fight for your brothers. It's a fight. We have to fight for our families. You have to fight for your marriages. If you don't fight for your marriage, your marriage won't survive because all hell is breaking loose to fight against your marriage. And I think so many people don't realize it. And then when their marriage is shaky, they're going, wait, whoa, 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 what's going on? Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. That's what's going on. But Jesus said, but I have prayed so that when you return, when you've gone through this, you'll strengthen your brothers. You have to fight for your children and for your grandchildren. You can't just sit passively by and just hope for the best. God has called you to engage in prayer warfare, to fight for the souls of lost people, lost prodigals, uh, for, for friend, lost friends and loved ones, family members, to fight for your health. Listen, we have to fight for our health. Satan comes after every one of us to attack us in our physical bodies. Don't think it's strange when it's happening to you. It happens to all of us. Why? Because Jesus said in John 10, 10, Satan comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. You got to fight for your health. I've got to stand continually for health in this body that's getting older by the day. And you do too. Don't let, when, so many times when God heals us, Satan comes to try to steal it from us, doesn't he, Paula? But don't let him. We're gonna fight back and we're gonna look at some ways that we do that. So fight for your health, fight for your finances, fight for your mental well being, fight to see revival in the church and awakening in our nation. God is looking for an army of remnant warriors who are willing to partner with heaven to bring heaven down. Are you one of the remnant? If you are, give him praise again this morning. All right, we're ready for point number one. Prayer weapon number one is praise. Woo, come on, give him a shout of praise. Woodland Park, give him a shout of praise. Praise, worship, thanksgiving. This is an important part of our prayers. In Jeremiah 31, 7, the children of Israel were in a desperate time. And God gives them the spiritual weapons for their breakthrough in verse 7. And this is what he tells them. He says, first of all, sing for joy. They, need, they had a desperate need. And God says in Jeremiah 31, 7, first you sing for joy. Now, now listen, a lot of times when we're getting beat down by the powers of darkness and when we're discouraged and we're brokenhearted because our circumstances stink and it just seems like we're getting hit upside the head over and over, Satan is beating us with that threshing tool. It, the last thing we wanna do is start to sing, right? But that's exactly what God tells us to do. Sing, 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 Heather. I've been singing over your family. Sing, sing for joy, sing for joy because Jesus Christ has already done it. It's finished. And then the next thing he tells them is he says, shout your praises and make them heard. Woo! Shout your praises and make them heard. Come on, Radiant. Shout your praises and make them heard. Now friends, that's, that's uncommon. That's uncommon. You know what's common? Oh, it's terrible, it's awful. Oh, where is God? God has forsaken me. I think I'm just gonna deconstruct my faith. Oh, woe is me. What's that old hee-haw? Doom, despair, agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. Wasn't that horrible? Those were demonic incantations. 
That's what's common. Common is to feel sorry for myself. I know, I'm just like you. I, that's, that's what I have to fight against that. And God says, don't you dare, you get up off of that floor, off the floor and you begin to shout your praises and you shout them so loud that everyone around you can hear it. You know, God kind of does away with the little, well, I think it's good just to be meek and quiet when I praise the Lord. Well, that's an interesting thought there, brother or sister, but that's not what the Lord says. God says, you shout your praises and you make them heard and then you cry out to me to save your people. And I, friends, I believe this is a holy mandate from heaven. This is a prophetic word from heaven to us in this hour. God's saying, you sing for joy because the joy of the Lord is our strength. We sing for joy first, and then we shout his praises and make them heard. That when the enemy comes in like a flood, we're not gonna weep and wail and wallow in self-pity. We're gonna get up and we're gonna shout the praises of God Almighty and make them heard so that the devil will hear and flee. And then we're gonna cry out to God, save our nation, save our nation, save our nation, God. Amen? Amen. This is uncommon to men, but it's common to God. Oh, oh the man, oh man, oh man, the time. It just seems like the clock goes faster and faster when I preach. 2 Chronicles 20, you guys know it. 2 Chronicles 20, they were in a desperate situation. They were going to be annihilated. And God tells Jehoshaphat, you send the praisers out in the front and you go to war just praising me. And what happened? You can read it if you have your Bible. It says, when, say it with me, when they began to sing and praise. It's exactly what God told them to do in Jeremiah 31, seven. When they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against their enemy and their enemy was defeated. Oh, hallelujah. Friends, that's why we go so crazy with praise in this house. It's not because we're trying to make you miserable and uncomfortable. God has not called us to be pacifiers on this platform. He's called us to be provokers, to provoke you to good works, to provoke you to engage in the calling of God and fulfill his divine destiny and purpose for your life. Give him praise again today. What's common is to grumble and gripe and complain. But God calls us to be uncommon. He calls us to be uncommon. I have to go back. The Lord tells me the prophetic dreams and visions I give you, you keep going back to them. I'll never forget the Sunday. I was standing up here leading praise and worship with Andres and Rachel. And the Lord gave me a vision. And then the vision I saw row after row after row after row of saints, warrior saints that were fully clothed in the armor of God, sword in one hand, shield in the other. And a massive lion was marching with us in the middle. And the Spirit of God spoke to me and he said, when you praise, I roar. And that's exactly what we see in the Bible. If any of, anyone says, oh, I don't know about that. Well, it's in the Bible. When they praised, the lion of the tribe of Judah roared and mowed down their enemies. God is amazing. You know what? This doesn't make sense to the natural mind. That's why it says in, in uh Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. Stop leaning on your own wisdom because your wisdom is nothing compared to God's. I got to tell you this other story, even though I'm out of time. One of my favorite stories was Derek Prince. I love listening to Derek Prince even now. Derek is in heaven now, but I'll, I'll never forget the story he told when he first went into ministry into pastoral ministry. He said that he was having a prayer meeting at his house, a small gathering of believers, and a woman came to the door and she had her husband with her that had just been released from prison. And he goes to the door and the woman says, um, pastor, my husband just was, was just released from prison and he's got demons. He needs deliverance. I need you to deliver him from these demons. Well, Derek said he didn't quite know how to go about it. So he welcomed them in and he gathered the people together and he said, well, what we're going to do first is we're just going to praise God loudly. And so they just begin to praise God loudly. Well, the guy slaps his hands over his ears and starts screaming. And he said, stop, I can't take it. I can't take it. I have to leave. And Derek stopped everyone and he pointed to the man and he said, if you leave now, the demons are going to leave with you. He said, but if you stay, the demons will go and you'll be set free. 
And so the man stayed through it. He crucified his flesh and his carnal nature and said, no, I am not going to let demons control what I do. And he stayed. And at some point, while they were wildly and loudly praising God, the man starts jumping up and down. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. They left. They left. They're gone. Praise silences the enemy and the avenger. Praise is a weapon and don't you ever forget it. Some of you, it goes against the flesh. It goes against your carnal nature. You don't feel like praising. You just want to, and you know what that is? It's like a strange demonic paralysis comes over you. I don't want to praise. Oh, no, I don't want to. I don't feel like praising. Well, that's when you take authority over your flesh and your carnal nature, and you say, I crucify my flesh and my carnal nature. I will not allow my flesh to dictate what I do. I let the word of God dictate what I do. And you throw up your hands and you open up your mouth and you begin to praise them because praise is a weapon. Hallelujah. Number two, scriptural declarations and prophetic decrees. In prayer, we need to pray the word of God. I will remind you again of a prophetic dream God gave me where an angel visited me. First time I'd ever had an angel, an angelic visitation. And the angel came to me and the thing he told me was the move of God will be carried on prophetic streams. And I said, what does this mean? I didn't even say it. I thought it. And he, could under, he knew what I was thinking. And he took me to Job where it says, you shall decree a thing and it will be established. And the Lord spoke to me in that dream through an angel and said, it is the praises, the shouts of praise, the prophetic decrees, and the prayers of God's people in one accord that will usher in the move of God. And then he said this at the end. He said, if you stop, it stops. Friends, we've got to press in like never before with prophetic decrees and scriptural declarations. That means we pray and we decree what God says over and against what it looks like, what it feels like, what it sounds like, what it smells like. Amen? So... Amos 3, 7 and 8 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And then I love this. It says, A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Sometimes in prayer, God gives us prophetic words from his word that are in alignment with his word to pray and decree in a situation. One is what we have been doing along with Dutch sheets and believers around the nation and the world for the last few years, decreeing America shall be saved. Instead of saying, well, it's all over, it's done, there's no hope, no. We turn to God's word in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen that says, where he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven and I will forgive them of their sins and heal their land. So we stand on that promise and we decree America shall be saved in Jesus' name. Here's another one from Psalm 68, one. We decree, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let all the enemies of God be driven away as the smoke is driven away by the wind. And victory is the Lord. Psalm 68, verse one. You lift up your voice and make your prophetic decrees. You pray that, you decree that over your house, over your family, over your children, over your finances. If you're living according to Malachi 3, Todd and I do this almost daily because we are faithful to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse according to Malachi 3, then we can boldly stand on God's promise, promises. And when things are rough and when it seems like our, our finances are being attacked, we can stand and decree that the Lord rebukes the devourer for our sakes and he is throwing open the windows of heaven and pouring out so much blessing, we won't have room enough for it. Make those prophetic decrees. Oh my goodness, you guys. Mark 11, 23, 24. Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. Now, we can't just ask for anything willy-nilly like a magician pulling things out of a hat. 
We have to make sure that we are in sync and in alignment with the heart of God and with the word of God. And there are times when God gives us a word from his word and we know this is the word of Lord and I'm st- of the Lord and I'm standing on it until I see this come to pass. Amen. You know, when Jesus spoke to a fig tree and it immediately withered up, he spoke to the storm and it immediately became calm. The Lord spoke to the paralytic and he immediately was restored. And I think about situations in our lives, like when our first home in San Diego was full of mold and we didn't have $80,000 for mold um, mitigation. And we didn't have mold insurance. We had to stand on the word of the Lord. We spoke to that mold and we commanded that mold to shrivel up, to dry up, to die and disappear in Jesus' name. And it did. I remember when I had warts and nothing would get rid of those warts. And so I began to curse those warts and I commanded them to shrivel up and die and go away. And almost immediately they left. I remember a few years ago when I could barely walk up these three stairs to the platform. I had to crawl up the stairs to kiss my children goodnight because my knees were in such bad shape. They were, I was in chronic pain. I was told I'd probably have to have knee replacement surgery. And I began to speak to my knees in the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, by his stripes, you are healed. And guess what? My knees are healed. I couldn't bend, I couldn't squat, I couldn't kneel. There are times when you have to speak to mountains and you command them in the authority of the name of Jesus to go. And if it doesn't happen immediately, you don't fall into a puddle of self-pity. You get up like a good soldier of God and you continue to stand firm in the faith and keep speaking to those mountains until they move. Number three is fasting and prayer. Fasting is setting aside food to pursue the Lord and his purposes in order to break through strongholds because Jesus told the disciples, there are some things, there are some demonic strongholds that only come, the breakthrough only comes through prayer and fasting. So there are times when we have to enter into uncommon prayer and fasting. And it means literally to put your hand over your mouth. Oh boy, there's a lot I could say there. It's not only fasting food or meals or certain types of food, but I'll tell you, I believe one of the greatest fasts that we can go on today is fasting phones, fasting media, fasting all the secular voices of the world in order to hear more clearly the voice of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One of my favorite things about winter retreat and youth camp is those kids are set free from their phones. Give God glory, honor, and praise. Every one of us need to fast our phones from time to time. Oh, so fasting for spiritual breakthrough. In Isaiah 58, verse six, God says, is this not the fast that I've chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness. I'll tell you what, when you are so addicted to your phone, your screens, and your devices that you cannot be without it. Listen, I'll tell you what, parents, go try to take your phone away from your teenager and see how they react. If they're like, give me my phone! It's an idol. It's a demonic idol. And you need to break those bonds of wickedness in the name of Jesus through prayer and fasting. Oh, we see this demonstrated in the life of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 10, there was a war in the heavenlies and the Bible gives us insight into what was happening. The angel Michael came and was warring against the prince of Persia, a territorial ruling spirit over that area, over that region. And it required Daniel to go into 21 days of prayer and fasting in order to break through and get the victory. And friends, that's where you and I are right now. Number four, praying in the spirit. And I've already talked about this. We need to pray in the spirit. In Ephesians 6, 18, when Paul said, put on all the armor and then you stand and you pray always with all kinds of prayer. And then he said, praying in the spirit, praying in the spirit. And specifically, again, praying in other tongues. It's being led by the Spirit, directed by the Spirit. But you know, there are many times when I go to prayer, and how many of you go to prayer and you don't know exactly what to pray or how to pray? Probably 100%. Man, if you guys know all the time, you're blowing my mind. Um, 
But, and sometimes it's a way of crucifying our flesh and our carnal nature and saying, I want my flesh out of the way. I want my carnal nature put aside. I want my natural reasoning and, and my personal wisdom, which is so like this compared to God's unlimited wisdom. I'm, I'm shutting it all out. Holy Spirit, take over. And I will begin to pray in other tongues. And, and this is not a, a le- message on tongues. We do have that available on the website. Um, for, for those of you who would like more teaching, but you have to partner with him. He doesn't come and take invisible fingers and move your tongue and your lips and cause sound waves to come through your vocal cords. You have to open your mouth. You have to trust in the Lord with all your heart and you just begin, and here's what will happen. The enemy will come and say, well, that's just babble. And that's when you hear the Spirit of God say, resist the devil and he will flee. How do you resist him? Through praise, through praying in the Spirit. Resist him and he will flee. And you keep praying in the spirit. You know, there was a time when I didn't know, there are so many times, but this is one of the most dramatic. Uh, This is actually in our Holy Rebel book, I think. I think I put that in there. But um, I'll never forget one day I was vacuuming when suddenly I had this burden come on me to pray for my sister Robin. I couldn't reach her by phone. And so I didn't know what was going on, but I just, have you ever had that? Sometimes you're awakened in the middle of the night with a burden for somebody. Don't ignore it and go back to sleep like the disciples. Get up and enter into uncommon prayer. And so I didn't know what to do. And Romans 8, 26 says, when you don't know how to pray as you ought, the Holy Spirit will intercede through you and groanings too deep for words. And so I just began to intercede for my sister in tongues. I didn't know how to pray. And I mean, I, it was intense intercession. And then finally I sensed that there was a release and a breakthrough. Well, I, fi- I was able to get a hold of her later, and I said, Robin, what happened today? And I told her what happened to me, and she said it was at the exact same time. She was on a lonely stretch of highway. She had my nephew, who was uh, small enough to be in a car seat in the back seat, and it was just her and Joe, and they were driving, and she said when suddenly an 18-wheeler came up on her tail and was trying to force her off the road. And she said it was terrifying. She said, I have no idea what this lunatic was trying to do. She said, but it went on for for quite a while, and she said, and then suddenly... He just went around her and drove off and left her alone. But I believe that was divine intervention. I didn't know how what to pray. Thank God I wasn't resisted to praying in the Holy Spirit because who knows what might have happened. God has chosen to involve us in executing his plans on the earth. Okay, we got to go to the last one, five, travail, travailing prayer. In John 16, 20 and 22, Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, You will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. How many of you have had those moments of prayer where you just feel it? I mean, Jesus goes on to say, it's like a woman when she's in labor. How many women at Woodland Park and here have been in labor? And you know the pain, the agony. You want that baby out and you want that baby now. Jesus said, when a woman is in labor, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But it's not, and and that's sorrow meaning pain. She no longer remembers, but once she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish. For joy that a human being was born into the world. That's perfect for the sanctity of human life day. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. It makes me think of the Psalms too. This says, those who sow in tears will come in rejoicing, bringing the sheaves with them, the harvest with them. There is a travailing in prayer where it is like a woman giving birth to something and you are, you're giving birth in the spirit. And a woman, when she goes into labor, she doesn't go to the hospital and labor and labor and labor for hours and then go, that's it. I'm quitting. I'm tired of this. Let's go home. Yet how many times do we do that in prayer? And God's saying, 
Right now, I am calling you to enter into uncommon prayer where you are willing to travail in intercession with me. And sometimes that means groaning and utterings too deep for words. It's partnering with the Holy Spirit in intercession, praying in the Spirit, praying in the understanding, singing in the Spirit, singing in the understanding. It's that pressing in and not giving up until the answer comes. I'm going to finish with this. In Galatians, Paul talks about travailing in prayer for the Galatians. He said, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is fully formed in you. And in 1 Thessalonians 3.10, it says, night and day, we were praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what was lacking in your faith. Well, if you look up the word exceedingly here in this verse, in the Greek lexicon, this is what you find. This is what this is saying. This is very great, excessive, loud, insanely furious prayers and intercession. So to those who would tell you, you just need to calm down and, and just be real calm and real quiet. You know what? There's a place for that kind of prayer. But when you're going to war against principalities and powers of darkness, there is also a place for what Elijah, did, what Elijah displayed and for what Paul displayed and for what Jesus displayed in the garden where you are pressing in and you are travailing with everything. You feel it in your spirit. You feel it in your body. You feel it in your emotions. Don't let that scare you or make you uncomfortable. Let it drive you to go deep deeper in travailing prayer until you see the breakthrough. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Father, we come to you this morning and we have heard your cry to us. Lord, even as you called Peter, James, and John to enter into that place of uncommon prevailing prayer and intercession with you, Lord, we hear you. And I say, God, give all of your sons and daughters ears to hear. Let them have ears to hear what you are saying so that we will crucify our flesh and our carnal nature. We will burn our own plans, our own agendas, our own calendars, our programs, those things that destroy Distract us and keep us from prevailing on common prayer. We lay them on the altar today and we say, God, let your fire fall and consume everything in my life that would hinder me and keep me from pressing in through prevailing on common prayer. And if that's your heart, get up to your feet and shout a loud amen. Come on, Woodland Park. Come on, Central Campus. Hallelujah. All right, Pastor Dustin, I'm turning this service over to you. Lord, your word was not written for our information. It was written for our transformation. And I pray that this word today, these aren't my words, Lord, they're yours. And I pray that they would go deep into every one of our hearts and take root and transform us from the inside out for your glory. It's all for your glory, Lord, not for ours, but yours. Now, if you're here today, this is the most important decision a person ever makes in their entire lifetime. And that is a decision to surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I know what it is to live apart from Him. It's meaningless, it's futility, it's darkness. The John, the Apostle John said that those apart from Jesus are under the power and the control of the evil taskmaster, Satan. You know, even if you say, well, I don't worship Satan. Well, if you don't worship Jesus, you're under Satan's dominion and his control. And the only way out of Satan's dominion the only way to be set free from Satan's darkness and control, the only way to eternal life is to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. So if that's you today, if you say, I have not surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, friend, you are on a very, very dangerous path. 
You're on a path that leads only to death, darkness, and destruction. I'm not, there's no way to sugarcoat it. And anyone who tries to sugarcoat where you are apart from Christ is a liar. They're a blind guide leading the blind. There are no blind guides in this house. And that's why we tell you the truth even when you wanna stone us for it. And we'll continue to do that. If we have to go to prison for preaching the truth, we'll go to prison. And we'll be like Paul and Silas when they were in bound by chains in the inner prison. And at midnight, they did what was uncommon. They began to wildly shout and praise God and sing hymns to Him. And then their bonds of every person were loosened and the prison gates flew open. Amazing the power of God when we do things His way. Stop reasoning. Stop leaning on your own understanding. That's foolish. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ today and you will be so glad, so thankful that you did. Set, be set free from the dominion and the powers of darkness. If that's you today and you say, I know I need to give my life to Jesus, will you raise your hand with me right now? All over this auditorium, up in the balcony, down here on the floor. If you need to surrender your life to Jesus today, Go ahead, lift up your hand. Don't be ashamed, lift it high, lift it high. See those hands. Most importantly, God sees those hands. Oh, hallelujah, Pastor Mark. God sees those hands. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. This is serious business. Okay, this is serious business because the enemy of your soul hates you, loathes you, despises you, and wants nothing more than to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give you life and to give it to you in the fullest. Today's your day to step into the fullness. Woo, hallelujah. I'm gonna ask prayer team members to come forward and I want you to come forward with those who raised their hands. Go ahead, go ahead and come forward. Every one of you who raised your hands, let's come forward and let's give, let's join with the angels in heaven in rejoicing over those who are making that decision today to follow Jesus Christ. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. We're gonna pray a prayer and we're gonna pray this together with you. Just say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you came for me. You died for me. When I was in rebellion against you, when I was dead in my sins, You came for me. Thank you, Jesus. I surrender my life to you. Jesus, forgive me of all my sin. Come into my life. Rule and reign in my heart. Be the Lord of my life. And fill me with your spirit empowering me to live for you. Amen, amen. Let's praise God again. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for every person who made that decision today. If you're online with us today and you made that decision to follow Jesus, let us know at decision at radiantchurch.org so that we can reach back to you and get materials to you that will help you grow in your relationship with Christ. Now it's important once you've made this decision that you get rooted and grounded in the body of Christ. Listen, we were not meant to be isolated and separated and try to make it on our own. God gives us a family, the family of God, so that we can grow together, amen? Now, prayer team members are here, and if you need prayer for anything today, if you need a miracle of healing in your body, come down here and let somebody pray with you. If you need prayer for anything, listen, we serve a God of miracles, signs, and wonders. So come today believing and expecting a miracle, amen? 
God bless you all. We hope to see you this Wednesday for groups. Tuesday night, we have an uncommon prayer meeting called Roar. Then Friday night until Saturday morning, we're having an all night prayer and worship service. Join us. We moved it to North Campus for multiple logistical reasons. So it will be at North Campus. And some of you maybe don't get up there very often and you'll be excited to see the progress on the North Campus building. So God bless you all. Let's go out and let's enter into uncommon prayer every day. Amen. You're dismissed.